Yes, and, and that's really what I want to talk about, this, this political history and, and vision. And, and so that's what I've, uh, I've kind of renamed this from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from racial division uh, to, uh, to, to one human family. So the idea that there's, a, there's this, if, when we study history, we see this problem of racial division. And by the way, when I, when I use this term race, which is a controversial word to begin with, I'm it's, used, it's kind of a shorthand term to thinking about different skin colors, maybe other types of differences of physical features without ascribing any necessary characteristics to those things. So in other words, uh, uh, why do we have division based on these types of physical differences? And, and how can we, we get, have this sense of sort of one human family. By the way, this graphic was 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 done uh, when they did the vigil. You, I don't know if you happen to get to that one on uh, the the sort of solidarity with the Syrian and Iraqi refugees uh, here, uh, seeing uh, seeing an identity with them. But I thought it was very applicable uh, to our case as well. I don't want you to read all those words. You know, uh, lots of words on text is is the usual reason for death by PowerPoint. So you know, I, I, all, all I want to do here with all of this stuff here is talk about how I think we do a pretty good job already, more or less, of, of teaching history here and, and, and the political past, uh, it, 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 both in terms of for, for framing the problem and talking about the, uh, the solution. And then I will also talk about maybe some areas where we could do a little bit better and, and maybe some areas that we could introduce to, to try to uh, even do a, a, a better job. But first of all, just some iconic photographs. And we're, we're really familiar with these types of things. This is where I think we've done pretty well. Th these images are, are familiar almost to everybody, I, I, I think, uh, where King outlines his, his vision and, and, and his dream. Uh, and, and of course, other great leaders at the, uh, the famous uh, Freedom March and back in 1963 did the same thing. John Lewis, who is still an important political leader, uh, was there along uh, with a lot of other people. And then other iconic photographs, rather than talking about vision, talking about what the problem is, the, the hostility uh, towards uh, 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 other racial groups uh, and, and this history of, of, of violence and, and, and oppression, uh, which certainly we get uh, from, from the past. Uh, and so we get both vision and, and, and the problem coming from the study uh, of history. Here, a few years ago, 2008, there was a lot of talk uh, when President Obama was, was first elected and a lot of hope that maybe King's vision uh, for a world in which we judged each other by the content of our character and not the color of our skin uh, was, was, was finally being realized. And, and had we entered a post-racial uh, uh, America and this, uh, this vision uh, was, was the vision being realized uh, in, in some uh, regard. And then of course we, uh, we're all familiar with all of the images and they're equally iconic from the last couple of years uh, of the institutionalized violence uh, against uh, uh, African Americans, along with all the other socioeconomic indicators that show that the vision has certainly not been uh, realized. Uh, but if, if we push history back a little bit further <coughs> uh, th uh, than this, we see another period of hope that the vision was going to be realized. The so-called Great Migration, the first half or so uh, of, of the 20th century. Over a million African Americans leaving the South and going up North to Chicago and New York and St. Louis and other locations, hoping that uh, this, uh, uh, this vision of being accepted as part of a human family and being given the equal opportunities uh, with everyone else was going to be uh, realized. And we know, of course, that their hopes were at best partially uh, realized that the realities of segregation in the northern cities and lack of opportunity was just as pronounced and sometimes even more rigid uh, than they had been uh, in the South. And, 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 and when we push the, the story back even a little bit further, then the question is, well, why are they all leaving the South? And we're familiar. Again, all kinds of iconic uh, images uh, that, that, that we're all pretty familiar with. Uh, the, just the humiliation of having different drinking fountains or different entrances to, uh, to theaters or different waiting rooms you had, all of that, all the way up. <coughs> And to the really serious uh, types of, uh, of, 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 of tragedies with thousands of, of, of lynchings that go on, uh, virtually all racially uh, motivated. And so this, uh, th these images, I think, uh, are disconcertingly well known um, uh, and, 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 and iconic uh, for, for all of us. And you push the story back a little further, you have, got, you have another period of vision. 
uh, and of hope, where you have white soldiers in the, uh, in, in the Civil War singing songs uh, like the Battle Hymn of the Republic in which they say, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. Uh, and, uh, and once the purpose of the Civil War isn't only about uh, restoring the Union, uh, but it's also to free the slaves, and it took quite a while for that to be the case, uh, then you add that vision uh, to, to the purpose of, of, of the Civil War. And, and, and it's a fascinating history, as we all know, and Lincoln was real torn by this, you know, and um, ex exactly how to balance those two great goals of, of union and, uh, and, and freedom together in, in this case. But uh, he does uh, end up with the Emancipation Proclamation. It's not not a universal proclamation. It's only aimed at African American slaves in the South, in the Confederate states, in the in the in, in the rebel rebel states, uh, which uh, he he declares to be forever. Uh, free. Uh, but then after the Civil War, almost immediately, one of the first things, we have the abolition of slavery and the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Uh, and, and of course, the whole slavery, pushing the story a little bit back, although this marks the end of slavery, uh, we have that centuries-long uh, experience of slavery here in, in, in the United States, which has such enormous importance uh, for us. And, and I think that we're relatively familiar uh, with with that story, that we've done a pretty good job uh, in thinking about that and showing what the, the fundamental problem has been in, in race relations uh, and, and the slave trade going all the way back uh, to Africa and the transatlantic uh, passage in, in which uh, some half million uh, Africans were forcibly brought to become enslaved here in the United States, another 10 million or so being brought to the Caribbean and South America uh, to, to, to be enslaved. And, and these, it, it, these are the stories that I think are generally pretty well known. And it, I think, by and large, our educational system has done okay. Uh, w w with this, and uh, 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 given all the improvements that maybe uh, could be made. Wh what I'm interested in is even pushing the story much further back than that. This, this pushes the story back, you know, say five centuries or so. And that's a pretty long uh, ways to push the story back. But history doesn't begin five centuries ago. So what can we learn about the problem? And ironically, maybe a way out of the problem if we look even uh, further back. And there's kind of two levels of, 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 of that that's worth uh, thinking about, it seems to me. And here's uh, where it, instead of us doing a good job, we do sort of sort of a good job uh, with, uh, with history. And, and that's looking at, uh, and, and we do have some courses here that are available that will cover this, but I think most of our students can get through uh, Villanova without studying uh, the pre-colonial African empires and civilizations, and there's a great number of them. We do a pretty good job, for example, with the ancient and medieval periods in the Mediterranean regions and in, and in Europe and so on. But in those same time periods in non-Mediterranean and non-European areas, I don't think we do quite as good job in, in, in most of our settings. So, I mean, how many of these civilizations can we rattle off? Uh, we, we can say quite a bit uh, about, uh, you know, uh, the, the Palestinian area or Palestine or Israel or ancient Greece or, uh, or ancient Rome or so on on and we're pretty familiar with those stories. How, how familiar are most of us with these types of stories? And we're familiar with the great architecture where, you know, we, 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 we know the various temples of, uh, in, in, in Rome and so on, but how familiar are we with the architecture or with the art, you know? We, we're familiar with some of the great artists uh, uh, in, in the Mediterranean, in the Europe, but how familiar are we with those in the pre-colonial African civilization? So that's one area we do sort of uh, uh, okay on, uh, but, uh, but it's not really very well. I think where, where, where we don't have much, as far as I know, uh, in, in the college is when we push the story even further back uh, than that, which I think has a lot of implications uh, for, for the origins of race. How can we think about race? Uh, which is such a difficult concept to talk about, race and ethnicity. Traditionally, race, you're, you're thinking of so-called biological terms and ethnicity about cultural terms. But how, how should we think about race and ethnicity 
Uh, and when we view it through these lenses of the last 500 years, maybe when we add the pre-colonial African empires, but, but where does race come from? I mean, why, why do we have these different races? And if we can understand that, how can that help us gain a, maybe a better sense of a vision of, 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 of the way forward? And that's where we, we have a couple of courses in our biology department, for example, uh, on human evolution. But to my knowledge, and I could be corrected, I don't think that we have much, if anything, in the College of Liberal Arts, uh, which covers this sort of uh, uh, material. And I just wanted to talk a little bit uh, about that and pushing political history way back to the origins of humans. Uh, and uh, what's interesting to me is, our, is the account that the physical anthropologists have been giving us about where we come from, and in fact, what's the origin of all currently living humans, uh, whether they're black, white, or anything else, uh, any range of skin color, any facial features, any body types, you know, if, if, if we're all homo sapiens, we're all humans, and that in fact, we have a common origin. A and this is, it's, it's, it's not a mythical account, uh, but it's a, a scientific account based on, uh, on, uh, uh, on evidence. Uh, and so I, I, what, is, what is the vision that comes comes out of pushing the story back to the origins uh, of, of, of Homo sapiens and before. Um, it, 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 physical anthropologists tell us that Homo sapiens, our species, has been around maybe for around 200,000 years. And then we have all kinds of extinct hominid or hominin groups other groups that sort of look like us. They're bipedal and, uh, and, and, and they have opposable thumbs and our other types of characteristics. They're all extinct. And, and, and our, so our closest living relative, uh, the physical anthropologists tell us, is the chimpanzee. It's not that we evolved from the chimpanzees, it's that we had a common ancestor with the chimpanzees about seven million years ago. Uh, and uh, so we, uh, and exactly the relationship between the different species, between our common ancestor with the chimps and ourselves is not absolutely clear. Um, although, you know, Australopithecus and Homo habilis and Homo erectus and, and then Homo sapiens is usually the line that it's suggested to be in, but it, 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 it's, it's a little bit more of a thicket than, than that sort of thing. But there is this progression or this, uh, the, this uh, well, evolution of, of different types of, of, of hominids. Uh, and, and where does race come into this? I mean, where did we get our skin colors? And, and, and that's what I kind of wanted to start with. Uh, and, and what are the origins of, of, of race? It seems as though our common ancestor with, with chimps, it's a pretty good guess that they had relatively light colored skin. Chimps have light colored skin. Now, why would that be the case? A and then, essentially when, when we start to become the so-called naked ape. One of the interesting evolutionary changes as, as these species develop is that we lose most of our fur and our hair. The difference with, between fur and hair is you've got a number of, 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 of hairs of, of coming from one follicle and here there's one hair coming from, from a follicle. But we become largely the hairless ape. Uh, except, you know, a few places, you know, but most of us, it's just skin, you know, with, uh, with tiny little hairs that don't make any difference. Uh, that actually has a big impact on us. Uh, and the, and the, uh, one explanation or one interpretation of why we have light skin when we have fur, or the primates have fur, and then it becomes dark skin, uh, is, uh, is, 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 as we all know, radiation is a problem. We're all told to, to put on lots of sunscreen when we go into the sun because it could give us melanoma, it could give us skin cancer. That's the problem with intense exposure, or exposure, long-term exposure to intense sunlight, which you're going to get in the areas where um, uh, hominids were first evolving, which is in East Africa. Most of the uh, fossils are found in uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, the Sudan, and so on. Areas which get pretty intense sunlight where if you don't have melanin, the, 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 the pigment which, uh, which gives uh, you know, the, the blacks their, their skin color, uh, if, if, if whites are in that sort of a setting, you're gonna get more skin cancer. Melanin becomes sort of a natural um, um, 
uh, uh, sunblock. Uh, and in other words, blacks are going to get less cancer uh, in, in, in intense sunlight areas, such as uh, East Africa, than, than whites would. They're going to survive better. There's a, there's a natural benefit uh, to, to, to having black skin there. Once you move north, uh, such as my ancestors did. They ended up back uh, up in Scandinavia where there's much less sunlight and you can go for long periods with very, very uh, dim sunlight. Uh, it, it, that it, it, the melanin blocks out the sun, which is, which is fine in Africa, but then if you don't have enough exposure to sunlight, you get less vitamin D. You know, we're all told that we're supposed to get 20 minutes of sunlight a day now to have a vitamin D because that's what helps uh, with the processing of calcium so that you can have strong bones. You, you tend to get rickets uh, if you don't have enough vitamin D. So if you didn't take vitamin supplements, or if you didn't have the right diet or something like that, blacks up in Sweden might have more problems with soft bones than I'm going to have. So is it a benefit to be black or white? Is it natural to be black and white? A and the answer is yes. Uh, in different circumstances, it's, it's going to be some places it's going to there's going to be an advantage to be black, and some other areas it's going to be advantage to be white, and it's just typical evolutionary response to uh, to uh, environmental uh, conditions. Uh, uh, so I, I think that it's 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 interesting to to say that you know whether you're white or black, it's both natural, uh, and it's been around for a long time. Now, one one question is why why did we become hairless? Why did we lose our hair? And it's the losing of the hair which seems to uh, perhaps be one reason for, for, for changes of, of, of skin color. Uh, here we've got some early hominids. These are not Homo sapiens. Uh, these, these are uh, Australopithecus afarensis from about uh, 3.6 million years ago. And uh, these footprints are very cool in, in uh, Tanzania. There's about 70 footprints. Uh, and uh, it, clearly you've got uh, a, a larger person walking uh, n next to uh, a, a smaller person. And there's been a lot of discussion about how to interpret that. Was it uh, an adult and a child? Was it a male and a female? You had more pronounced sexual dimorphism at that point. In other words, there was greater size difference between male and female uh, than, than, than what we have uh, now. There's a slight sexual dimorphism now, but it's not as pronounced as, as it still is, for example, among the apes, uh, where there's, uh, it's still uh, very pronounced. But in, in other words, it, it's sort of an endearing thing because it looks as though they're just walking along together. What's, what's important about that, uh, perhaps, is, is that and other evidence that we seem to have suggesting that, that these primates, these hominids, these hominids, like currently existing chimps and apes and so on, are very social. Uh, there's, there's lots of social interaction, and, 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 and we, we live in fa family groups and kinship groups and, 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 and so on. And why is that so important? Because look at these people here, or hominids uh, here, and then think about where they're living in Africa. If you put them down in the Serengeti right now, um, uh, you know, what advantages would they have relative to the other famous types of animals which are there, uh, the, the lions and the cheetahs and so on? A and you think it's not good. Uh, th they don't have claws, they don't have talons, they don't have wings, they don't have shells. They don't have all of those defensive and offensive features that give a lot of animals their, their advantage. So what advantage do they have? How are you going to survive? Uh, how, how are we going to survive? Uh, and, uh, and, and one thing, our, our advantage and their advantage seems to be uh, cognitive. Uh, they, they're able to relate to each other. They're able to form kinship groups, and they're able to solve some problems. And so it, the, 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 the development of our brain is, is, becomes our most important comparative advantage. We don't have those natural weapons that a lot of others do, but we do have the ability to solve problems and, and, to, uh, and, and to organize among ourselves. And, and how is it that that develops? For example, that, that advantage develops gradually over time. For example, those folks uh, had, uh, had brains that were, you know, uh, maybe a quarter uh, of our size. And over time, 
the, the size of the brain increases, and maybe it's complexity too, uh, greater areas for so-called rational analytical uh, thought. But as you go through the usual progression of Australopithecus and Homo habilis, Homo erectus, and so on, you really keep getting larger and larger brains. We start out with, you know, some, uh, on average, four or five hundred uh, uh, cubic centimeters, all the way to, uh, uh, on up to us, about thirteen or fourteen hundred, and on average. Uh, we have a lot bigger brains. We've got a lot more, and, and that's important, it seems to me, because that's what enables us, uh, as, as we have this, uh, this greater cognitive uh, ability, and along with its symbolic thought and language and all of this ability, to form all kinds of increasingly complex social organizations and, and political a, a, a arrangements and to, to solve uh, problems. And, uh, the pro th there's a couple of problems with big brains, as, as good as they are for all kinds of reasons. There's two big problems with them. Uh, the first is they take a lot of energy. We've got to go get a lot of food to feed our brains. Uh, and, and, and so we have greater demands on, on us in, in, in that regard. And it provides enormous problems for women in childbirth. It's much more dangerous and painful to, 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 to give birth uh, given our relatively large uh, brains. Uh, so we have to have our children born early. Uh, with, with soft skulls and with still not fully formed brains, which means we have very long childhoods. It takes us a long time to get offspring to sexual maturity. And we have to have adult relationships developing over a long period of time uh, to, uh, to, to make sure that we can raise these children uh, to get them to sexual maturity. So the brains are both a kind of a blessing and a problem uh, of, of for us. Uh, uh, but they also have to be cooled. It's really important for us to keep uh, the temperature of, uh, in, in our heads relatively uh, regulated. And it seems as though we, we develop sweat glands uh, a, along with our big brains as a way to cool off, uh, which is really important to do in, in Africa. So why do we become hairless? Why did we lose our fur? Why is that an advantage? There's a, there's a couple reasons for that, but at least one reason is it might be easier to keep cool. And now dogs pant, and so they, they have that famous ability to, to regulate their body temperature in, in that regard. Uh, but we have sweat glands, but they work only if we aren't covered with fur and, and, and with hair. So, so, so why do we lose our hair and our, and our fur? to somehow maybe regulate uh, this, and there may be other reasons as, uh, as well. But it's tied in then uh, to then the development of race. As we become hairless, we also start to become darker skin to protect us from the radiation. And the reason for that is that this, the, it gives us an advantage in working together and with developing economically. And, and so we have tool use, which goes way back. We're not the only ones who use tools. Chimpanzees use tools. They, they, they strip uh, 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 um, twigs from trees and take off the leaves and put it into termite uh, nests. And the termites grab onto it to defend the nest. And they pull it out and eat the termites. So they make and use tools, unlike baboons, which, which don't. They just wait for the termites to emerge. So, so our closest relative will make and use tools. So we're probably making and using tools throughout this period. And we keep making and using more and more sophisticated tools as that goes on. So there's other reasons than just being social. Uh, there's also, and, 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 and then there's, there's, there's artistic uh, reasons. Uh, uh, I'm really fascinated by this. Uh, these, uh, these are from a cave in South Africa from somewhere 80, uh, 90, uh, maybe 100,000 uh, years ago. And what's interesting to me, this is a very small piece of, of, of rock. It would fit in, 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 in your hand. But whoever made that thing, as you can see, was interested in patterns. It's not just random scribbling uh, here. This, uh, somebody took time to etch this, uh, this kind of fishnet pattern uh, on there. So, uh, uh, 
whatever they're thinking, uh, they're, they're, they're observing patterns, they're creating patterns, um, and, and then these shells are interesting uh, because they were found there as well and they had these holes drilled in them. Uh, you interpret those as you want, but uh, were they kind of strung together with some sort of a little rope or something and then used for personal adornment, whether for beauty, beauty or for, uh, for some sort of ritual uh, purpose? But, but you start to see here, you see here in Africa, about 100,000 years ago, the, the development of, of culture. Uh, the development of, of learned behavior and, 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 and its development, it's not the origins because even chimpanzees uh, have learned behavior. There, there's ways that they, 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 they gain access to food which are different from one troop to, to, to another troop. Uh, and uh, the, 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 so, so that's been around maybe for a long time. But the, but the artistic expressions, the, the tools and so on get more and more complex uh, but in, in Africa, uh, when, when, when f the uh, hominids are, uh, are, are evolving, all of that is going on. It doesn't take, uh, it, it continues when they leave Africa, but it, it, but it goes on uh, uh, there. So anyway, what I'm interested here is if when you push the story this far back, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of years, you, you, you get a few lessons, the lessons from history. One is we really do have a common origin uh, that, uh, that, uh, that it, 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 we all have descended from this group, uh, that race, racial differences are natural, uh, and that they emerge from our uh, ability to be social uh, and create uh, social communities, which strikes me uh, as, uh, as, as extraordinarily important. Uh, then you've got, a, a, if I, just to change uh, tax just a, a, a little bit, uh, and to look at, uh, all right, so we start from, uh, for, uh, with evolution in Africa. One of the big issues that the physical anthropologists have dealt with is, how, where did all these people come from? We got people all over the world now. Uh, and they're different races with different skin colors and different body types and different cultures and different languages and all kinds of, uh, of, of, of differences. So where do they all come from? It's a, it's a question that we've been asking for a long time. The whole Tower of Babel story and, uh, and, 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 and the Bible is based on that question of where did all these people with different cultures and different languages come from and where, how, how did they all get here? And it's one of those things that we've been asking for a long time. The, the, uh, the, the rule, uh, and one of the debates that, uh, the, that the anthropologists have had is, is that they said Homo erectus, that, uh, that, uh, that hominid species that comes before uh, Homo sapiens, left Africa and got as far as China and, and elsewhere. Uh, and so one of the questions is, did Homo sapiens evolve mm -hmm. in different locations independently? Do current Chinese people go back to the Homo erectus who lived there a million years ago or more, and, and do current African people descend independently from, uh, from other groups of Homo erectus uh, uh, who, who lived in Africa at the time? But do you have independent uh, strands of evolution? <coughs> Excuse me. And the consensus now is that that doesn't seem to be the way, uh, that uh, Homo erectus like one more hominid group went extinct. I mean, 99% of species or more uh, that have ever existed are extinct. I mean, uh, species go extinct. Uh, they, they have lifespans uh, really like individuals do. So it's nothing really remarkable uh, that, that a species should go extinct. <coughs> And it's also not remarkable when you think about how few advantages hominids had when they don't have talons and claws and t fangs and wings and shells and so on. All they've got uh, are relatively small brains. Um, <coughs> uh, so, so they went, it seems as though the common wisdom is that Homo erectus went extinct. And where Homo sapiens were our kind, <coughs> uh, developed, are still in East Africa, where most hominid species had, uh, had, uh, had, had, had evolved, um, and that, uh, that, that they first appear around 200,000 uh, years ago. Uh, and then the question is, how did Homo sapiens, humans, our kind, get from there? Why did they leave Africa? <coughs> Why did they end up populating the whole world? 
Uh, and <coughs> putting that story aside just for a second, we'll come back to that in a minute, but the whole idea of identity through migration stories is really interesting. We, we ha it's very important here in, in, in the United States, for uh, example. I mean, we talk an awful lot about the Oregon Trail. Uh, that's kind of popular. We, uh, the, the, the various migrations of, of Americans across the North America uh, co continent. And, and, and we've celebrated that in art and so on. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures in that regard, uh, a, a picture by an artist called John Gass back from the late 19th century called American Progress. I don't know if you can see it very well, but you have uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, woman in a flowing white gown. She's not holding a Bible, actually. That's a, a, a kind of a, English, uh, a, a workbook for, for learning the language. Um, and she is over you know, flying over this great uh, migration movement. Uh, and you see here, you've got, the, of course, the Conestoga-style wagons here coming. Uh, you've got the Pony Express up there and the stagecoaches here. And then you've got industry and, 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 and the railroads coming from the east. And they're all moving west. And, and what are they leaving in their wake? Well, you've, you've, you've got farming here. Uh, you've got the explorers uh, and, and the, uh, the original settlers uh, as, as they go west. And, and, and who's fleeing in front of them? You've got a bunch of in, in sort of it's dark here and the Native Americans or the Indians are, are, are sort of fleeing in front of this American progress. And here you've got sort of the ominous dark wilderness going on and, and, and the ominous uh, seas uh, up there so, uh, and, and the light progress over there. So you've got this story of migration moving from east to west in which we're civilizing uh, this territory and we're, 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 we're making it good uh, and, and, and so on, which was common to, uh, a common uh, view here in the in, in the 19th century. Uh, but it's this part of that migration forming the, uh, an American identity, an, a, a national identity, which is, it's not just in the late 19th century. I don't know if you guys ever played this, but at least when my kids uh, were, were young, we, we, we got them copies of the Oregon Trail. It was, it's a great game, it's, a really, it's really fun. I, I, what did they sell? 40 million, 65 million copies of this game that they sold over 40, 40 years. It's gone through all of these editions. Uh, 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 and uh, it's, 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 a, it's a fun game, but, uh, but that, that, uh, that mythology uh, of the Oregon Trail uh, has just informed us and, and, it's, and, and it's had a great effect on, on us being Americans. It, what's, it, it's what it means to be America uh, in Omaha. Uh, I, I got to go to this wonderful park. They just opened this up a couple of years ago. Uh, and this is just a little part of it. It goes on for I don't know how many blocks. Uh, and they have all kinds of these life-size and larger than life-size uh, statues uh, which they've made of the, of, the, of the settlers moving as part of the, the great westward migration. Uh, and, uh, that, uh, and, and Omaha has put an enormous uh, amount of effort in, uh, into this celebrating the spirit uh, of, of uh, wilderness and, and pioneer courage park that goes on and, and uh, anyway it's a, it's a great park but it's part of that uh, the mythology uh, of, of the migration and the formation of, of American national identity which comes uh, from, uh, from, uh, from migration um, and it, it, it just seems to me that we've got another story if we push it a little bit further back, uh, uh, and, and that is, can can we, if we if we looked at the last seventy thousand years, for example, instead of the last couple of centuries, and didn't just look at the Oregon Trail, but looked at global human migration, uh, would we have a, a, a sense of human identity that comes from, uh, from 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 the telling of this story and the study of this history? Uh, rather than, than exclusively a national identity. I don't think there's anything wrong with national identities, but to, but, but to place them within a, a larger story strikes me as interesting. So, so now the physical anthropologist, uh, one of my favorite books is by Stephen Oppenheimer. Uh, he, he wrote a book called The Real Eve. And he said there really was an Eve. It's just that she didn't live in Mesopotamia 6,000 years ago. She lived in East Africa 150 some thousand years ago. In other words, there was a very small group, a couple thousand individuals or so, uh, of, of Homo sapiens 
who are all of our ancestors, or the ancestors of, uh, of all currently uh, e existing people. A and they started to populate different areas uh, of Africa as best as we can, uh, as, as best as we can tell. But then, the, you know, there's climate change in different periods of time, and there was climate change here, and uh, the, uh, so some of the folks tell us that you start to have uh, a drier climate. I the Sahara wasn't always just a, a, a desert, uh, but you start to have a a climate change which, which increasingly dries uh, Africa. This is not the first time there's been climate change in Africa. In fact, one argument about why did we stop living in trees uh, and having shoulders that really s facilitated swinging in the trees, just like you know the orangutans do now or something. They live in trees and they can really move around in those branches really easily. Our shoulders change. So, I mean, we can do that, but we can't do it nearly as, as, as well as they can. Uh, but what we can do is walk upright. They can, but it's, a, it's an effort for them. And very often they're knuckle walkers. They sort of have put their knuckles on the ground to, to stabilize themselves. So, so why do we become bipedal? Uh, what happened? Uh, this is a long time. This is millions of years ago. Uh, but the one argument is you did have sort of a change in, in the African uh, setting, so that you went from, from forest to savanna, from, from trees to grasslands. There's, there's not as many trees to swing from, uh, or there's, uh, there's much more grassland between existing forests, uh, and uh, there are various reasons in that setting to have an advantage in walking upright on two legs uh, uh, instead of swinging through trees that don't, that, that, that don't exist. So maybe climate change led to one of our characteristic body types, which is to stand up straight and then have two, uh, two limbs that are free to do other things uh, and hands that can, uh, that, that can do uh, 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 other things as, uh, as well. But in any case, uh, so climate change has had an effect in, in, in much more recently, 65, 70, 80,000 years ago. If, if, if that's the reason, it, it might be one explanation for why people need to leave. They need to find sources of, uh, of, of food. They're all scavengers, and then later we become hunters, and we're gatherers. Uh, so we're, uh, we're a scavenging, gathering, hunting, nomadic uh, species. Uh, and and you, can, you can only have uh, a relatively small number of people on a relatively large amount of territory with that sort of source of energy and, and foodstuffs and, and so on. Uh, as you have the drying out of, of, of the conditions, you're forced to move on. You have to find new, new land. So maybe this is one reason why people left Africa and started looking for other areas. You, you start to have, about that period of time, a great migration. It's not the Oregon Trail, it's the Global Trail. Uh, and uh, th there's different interpretations of how they moved. I mean, this map particularly uh, has them uh, going here uh, uh, and, and, and then uh, into Arabia and then across the uh, Indian Sea, which is, uh, which is possible. Others have them going the northern route uh, and going across the Sinai Peninsula and into Palestine and, 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 uh, and hugging the coastline. But uh, in either case, it, it seems most likely that the, that the route is, is, is up here and then following the coastlines more or less uh, here along Asia and then in South Asia. Um, it, it seems as though that's where people are, uh, are moving. And then getting to Australia about 50,000 years ago, which is really impressive because there's no land bridge, as, uh, even at this point, uh, between these islands and Australia. The only way to get to Australia is to sail there somehow. Uh, and, and a fairly decent distance. You're not just hugging the coast. I mean, if they took the coastal route, uh, did they go across the Indian Ocean like that? Maybe, maybe not. Or did they, st did they stay along the coast, see, even if they had canoes and something? It seems a, a maybe a little bit more likely. But they couldn't hug the coasts to get to Australia. So there, it's pretty open sea sailing. Uh, and, and, but we do know that, uh, that people Humans get to Australia by around 50,000 uh, years ago. Uh, and, and then after that, they start making their way up into Europe. 
well, some 40,000 years ago. Uh, it, it, when they try to move north uh, here in, in Asia, of course, then they run into Siberia, uh, which is not any fun to cross. And it takes a long time to figure out how to do the things you need to do to survive a crossing across Siberia, which is you know, really a for forbidding place. Uh, so it, it's, it's first you have to have a cultural development to learn how to produce the type of clothing and so on, that so, and, and, and have sources of food in, in this tundra uh, so that you can get across uh, Siberia. And you had to have climate change uh, again, which, uh, which makes a big difference. Um, uh, at this point, uh, it, 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 the world is colder than, than it is on average uh, uh, now. A and you have more water locked up uh, in, in glaciers and so on uh, than, than, than we have now. Because so much water is locked up in, in frozen water uh, in, in ice, in fact, at this time, you have ice sheets which come down even to where we are, maybe a mile high. I mean, we're, we're living under an enormous glacier here uh, at, at this point in, in North America. So half of North America is under uh, a, a big glacier. And because you've got so much water locked up uh, in, in, in ice, uh, on the continents and, and, and in the poles and so on, uh, the sea levels are lower than they are now. Uh, and uh, and uh, when you lower the sea levels, uh, you expose land that, uh, that now is covered with water. So there is, at this point, uh, a land bridge, uh, the Beringia, between what is Russia now and, uh, and Alaska. Uh, and so uh, once people figured out how to get across uh, Siberia, and if they were following herds, reindeer, other migratory animals, and so on, uh, they, they might have reason to be following these uh, creatures as they uh, made their way uh, from, from Russia even into Alaska. But it seems as though starting around and this is hotly contested. People really argue about exactly when this was. Was it 16? Was it 20,000 years ago? Could it be earlier? Uh, but it's, it's, you know, that's, that's the common wisdom. It's around there somewhere. That people started walking across Beringia or maybe taking canoes and going along the coasts of that. If they were walking across Beringia, there seems as though they were, there were a couple of great, sheet, great glaciers, great sheets of ice, and that there might have been, it's pretty tough to walk across a glacier, uh, but there seems to have been a, 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 a split between them where they could have gone through uh, sort of the central part of, of, of North America and get south from there, or maybe they went along the coastline, or maybe they went in both directions, uh, but but, uh, but in some way or another, by 15, 16,000 years ago or, or more, people had made their way all the way across Beringia and then down all the way into, uh, in, into South America, which is quite a hike, right? Um, it was, uh, there's other interpretations. You see the Pacific Crossing arrow. Thor Heyerdahl, uh, I don't know if you ever had to read Kontiki. He was an anthropologist from way back when, and he got excited about the idea that maybe people went from, uh, from uh, uh, these islands here, and they didn't just take that route, but they went all the way across the Pacific Ocean. That's a huge transoceanic uh, uh, journey uh, and, and there were some people who were claiming this was done as early as 40,000 years ago and they got to places in Chile and elsewhere uh, about that time. I, I, I don't think it's quite yet broadly accepted, but, uh, but it, it's, it's not impossible. But it, it, for, for most people, the common wisdom is it seems it's more likely that most people were able to get here. And in different waves, there, there seems to be evidence both from genetics and from linguistics. You seem to have family groups which indicate, uh, or, or linguistic family groups, uh, that people came in different waves from Mongolia here, from this part of the world, uh, and, and that you have the currently existing uh, uh, four different language groups here, suggesting that one group came first and another group came behind them and, uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, and genetic evidence seems to suggest that uh, as well. And th there's some 
uh, evidence mainly that, uh, that, that maybe you had some Atlantic crossings as well. Uh, all of us who are Gustafsons are very excited about the idea that maybe the Vikings made their way there. It doesn't seem as though they had long-lasting settled uh, communities that, that ended up populating uh, the, uh, the Americas. Uh, that, that they got to as, uh, you know, Greenland or Iceland or something is, is, is possible. Uh, but it doesn't seem as though they settled, uh, uh, you know, lasting communities there. You know, some people have thought, for example, there was another Atlantic crossing from, from Africa across uh, to, uh, to Central America, uh, the, the, the Olmec region, <coughs> which is sort of the, the Greece and Rome of the ancient uh, 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 Central American uh, region. Mesoamerican region uh, from 1800 BC or so uh, have these monumental heads, like they're 10 feet tall or something, uh, and they have stereotypically East African facial features to them. They sort of look like they're Africans. And, uh, so there's some suggestion maybe people made their way across from Africa uh, to, to Mesoamerica. So there's, there's alternative ideas uh, out there, but it still seems as though the, the, the majority tend to emphasize this, this, this pr predominant migration uh, from, from Africa to Asia, across Siberia, and then uh, down the, uh, the continents uh, here, uh, which was uh, also made possible because uh, the North and South American continents used to be separate until Central America formed about three million years ago. So uh, that wouldn't have been possible had people shown up before that, but there weren't people before that, so that's okay. But all of that is simply part of the idea of this great migration, maybe the first era of globalization. Um, and, and anyway, if we studied this, which I don't think we do, as, as far as I know, uh, I don't think there's any courses here in our College of Liberal Arts where, where this is, uh, is covered. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any computer games that are available uh, on this, like you know, the, the Oregon Trail. Um, I, I, I'm not aware of parks that are, are made in celebration of what is really an impressive migration. Now, it took 70,000 years. It didn't just take a century or something like that uh, or, 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 or so. Um, it, it, it took tens of thousands of years, but, you know, the, uh, and we don't have the stories because there's no written accounts uh, of the you know, there's no writing until, you know, five or six thousand years ago. So the vast majority of this story can only be told by the limited archaeological evidence that exists, by the genetic evidence uh, that exists. And we don't have people's names. Uh, we, we, would have to, uh, we would have to have novelists putting uh, together historical fiction, uh, which is maybe based on true events, but uh, which the specifics are the types of things uh, that, that we would have to sort of uh, construct. But, but the evidence that does exist uh, suggests a really impressive human achievement uh, of, of figuring out without maps. They didn't have a map of this. They didn't know where they were going. Uh, they, they had to, and they had to solve all kinds of problems along the way. Siberia would be just one of, of the problems that, uh, that they had to solve. Uh, and, and so it seems to me that this is really ripe for a, a, a dramatic story that, that you know, would be just as impressive, if not even more so, than the Oregon Trail uh, kind of story. And you start to form a sort of a human identity. So what's the advantage, I think? Or what's the, what's the the political lesson of pushing the story this far back. And I think that as you study the evidence for it, you can't study primary documents. Uh, in other words, that so much of our education in, liberal, in the liberal arts is based on reading primary texts. And I like reading primary texts. I think they're great. But primary texts don't show up until 4,000 years ago or so. We, we don't have the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh and the Bible and, uh, and, and, and Plato and, and all of these fabulous primary texts that we, that we read in most of our liberal arts courses. They don't exist until just a few thousand years ago. So we have to learn how to read other types of sources. Uh, and, and, and this is why this sort of story is pretty well known in the natural sciences, for example, because they're used to studying 
evidence like this, so rather than just primary text. But in the liberal arts traditions, we don't. We don't go to labs and we don't go out to observe uh, you know, uh, uh, natural uh, phenomena. We go to libraries. Uh, and, and libraries are great. Libra uh, so uh, so it, it does entail sort of a change in, in how we think about what we're going to study and what sources we're going to learn from. Uh, but in, in this sense, the physical evidence some, to, some of it is genetic, some of it is stories told by our blood. Uh, uh, others of it are, 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 are fossils and, and rocks and so on. Uh, uh, but, but those things tell uh, a, a story. Uh, and, and, and together, I think what they tell us uh, is, is a story of common human origin uh, and, uh, and a great common human uh, achievement uh, and, and a dramatic story of migrating and, and settling the, the, the world. And, and it just seems to me that uh, what we have here, and that's where all this, te this text, uh, I don't want you to read it here, uh, but uh, I, I think what, what we've done pretty well is talking about the last five centuries of history. Uh, the problem with that, it seems to me, is that it's really primarily uh, a history of tragedy and oppression uh, and of hostility and of conflict. Uh, and that, it, that this is real. Uh, this has been what has characterized so much racial relations in, in the last number uh, of, of centuries. Uh, and it includes some aspect of visionaries, the Martin Luther Kings of the world uh, and, uh, and, 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 and others who have tried to achieve transformations. Uh, but I think if we, if we push the story a little bit further back to that pre-colonial African uh, region and looked at the achievements uh, of, of, uh, of, of Africans uh, rather than just their being victims, uh, you look at them a little differently. And then if you push the story much further back, you say that it, it's, it's really scientifically true. It's not just an aspiration and a nice uh, kind of uh, you know, feel good thing uh, to say that we are part of one human family. In fact, we are. We really do have common ancestors and that there is a, a scientific account, an evidence-based account uh, for, for our common uh, origins, uh, which doesn't maybe solve anything because families can be as dysfunctional as any other group and maybe worse sometimes. Uh, but, uh, but the idea that there's really every person that you know is part of an us story. Uh, and, and that there's not these fundamental divides. I think one of the problem in, in 19th century accounts of racial origins is that there were fundamentally different origins for the races. They were created separately and they developed separately. And, and so to overcome those physical differences seems so overwhelmingly uh, difficult now. Or now if we look at the historical differences created by the last five centuries, we think how can we possibly overcome overcome them and honestly look at the people of other races as, 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 as fellow humans um, and, 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 and how to bridge those cultural gaps becomes uh, the, the key issue. It just, it just seems to me if we had a study of this deep past uh, it, and put the more recent past within that context, it starts to transform the idea. And it's not as difficult to say that we really are all humans for all of our problems. And, and, it, and it doesn't mean because we came from the same group that they didn't have their problems. We know, for example, that troops, that kinship groups of chimpanzees, they can fight with each other. They can be vicious towards each other. Uh, so we can sort of assume that our common ancestors with them, just because they were all part of a kinship group, didn't always behave uh, nicely towards each other. So it doesn't solve anything, but it does, I think, transform the narrative into saying we've got a common origin, we have this these common achievements uh, and that there's, there's, a, there's a commonality between us which really does provide evidence uh, for, their, for their being an us in, in which the them are, uh, are, are, are located. And, and it seems that the irony then in that is if you look further back in the past, you start to have maybe a better vision for where we can go in the, in, in the future and it's a little easier 
to, to not concentrate on, uh, on the, the, the divisions and the hostilities between us, but maybe that the, by looking further back, we can have this vision uh, for, uh, for the future. Well, uh, well, well, you've been very patient and, and very willing to listen to me ramble on for all of this stuff. So thank you for, your, uh, <laughs> for being here and for, for, uh, for listening. Appreciate it. I guess, what, can I ask you any response? What do you think? Maybe you've already studied. Maybe this is all uh, familiar to you. What's, uh, what's your response to any of this, if I can bother you and ask? What do you think? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I really like uh, how you go back and look at like, history um, and gain like, perspective from that. Because um, I've you know, only really looked at up to probably Plato, the Greek era. But I really haven't looked much deeper than that. And you definitely uh, gain a lot of perspective when you do that. So I, I like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, and I'll have to say this was my educational background. I was a philosophy and history undergrad major. So, I mean, uh, you know, I started the story with Gilgamesh and Plato and the Bible, and, and I love those sources. That's what I've spent my life doing is reading that kind of stuff. Uh, so I, so I, 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 I in no way am, am sorry that I've spent so many decades uh, doing that because, I mean, these, I, I, the, the whole written record of the human past is, is a really, really important uh, achievement uh, for us. But, but I do think it's a shame that, that, and it sounds like your experience was very similar to mine. Uh, I, I got my PhD and I was teaching for a couple of decades before it finally dawned on me there really was a past before 2500 BC in, in ancient uh, 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 Greece and so on. And, and that past goes way back. Uh, and, in, and the natural scientists are familiar with this stuff. They, they, uh, the astronomers talk about 14 billion years without batting an eyelash. And the, uh, and the biologists talk about hundreds of millions of years of evolutionary thought. And so for them, this is commonplace. For those of us like me who come out of the arts tradition, it's, we just have, you know, we've heard of it, you know, we're, we're sort of vaguely aware of it, but, but we just haven't had it incorporated in, in our educational background. Um, and it's just really interesting, for one thing, it seems to, uh, to me, but, but I think it starts to change our, 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 our attitudes about a lot of things when you start to see that, uh, you know, man, this, uh, this, is, this is really a long story. And it's hard for us to get a, gain a sense of that, you know. Uh, I, I'm all of 61 years old now, so, you know, I can sort of understand a century now. I, I, I kind of get that. Uh, and, and, and maybe I can even understand, you know, the idea of 2,500 years ago. I mean, it's a little hard for me to grasp that. But when I start thinking of 200,000 years ago, or 7 million years ago, or the, the formation of the Earth 4.6 billion years ago, I don't even know what those numbers mean, you know. And, uh, and, 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 and s but I think part of the problem in thinking about that was it just hasn't been taught. It just hasn't been part of, uh, of, of our educational experience. And that in this regard, I think we really need to have that better gulf between the liberal arts, uh, what we do in St. Augustine. I, what, I don't know what major you're in or what, what, what field are you in? Um, I mean, I've taken courses all over. Okay. I've taken a lot of anthropology. Okay. Okay, so this um, is familiar to you. Yeah, I've seen kind of, um, yeah, like I understand the points you're making and I've seen that within the educational space. I think as far as history classes, like I took history on ancient Egypt, uh -huh. I think it's still pulled from a very Eurocentric Western point of view, um, which kind of can flaw the argument. And I agree that we Yeah, we're so, I mean, we know the Roman Empire and we know the British Empire, you know, but, but, but we don't 
you know, they, all of the African empires and all of the Asian empires, they just don't roll off our tongue uh, like, uh, like the others do. And it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a fault of our educational system. It's not any individual's fault. We just haven't been studying that uh, sort of thing. But yeah, so your study of anthropology and phonetics, now where did you study that, if I can ask? Okay. So okay. I got to cover a lot of, uh, a lot of those things, yeah. Yeah, and, and phonetics or, or linguistics. Uh, you know, I, I wish that we had a person teaching the origin of language here. Um, as far as I know, we don't have anybody like, like that, to my knowledge, um, and, and, and which is a phenomenal development, uh, it seems to me. Now, maybe this is the sort of thing that you have uh, been, been studying. Uh, yeah. Um, I think now with with the study of race, um, most of academia like acknowledges it no longer as a biological construct. It's now looked upon as a social construct. Um, and I was reading a book, and it said that in order to overcome racism, we need to overcome nationalism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, first of all, I think it's really important. I mean, I, it, it's, it's, to my limited understanding, there are these sort of stereotypical physical differences that we see. I mean, there's darker skin and there's lighter skin. And so if you use race as a shorthand term for it's kind of stereotypical physical differences, they're there. The problem has been that we've associated, it seems to me the problem has been that we, we've ascribed in the past all kinds of characteristics that are, are biologically related to those differences. And that's, I think, is what has quite correctly been just blown up out of the water. So, we, uh, so, it, it, so it, I, I would still argue that actually race is, a, is an important thing. There are, you know, there's different genetic reasons why there, some people have one color skin and one have another. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, but w the problem is that the, some people have said, well, this leads to characteristics. Some people are inherently lazy because of that, or uh, they're smarter, or something like that. That's where we've gotten into huge, huge problems in the, in, in the past. So as far as I can see it, that, uh, and, and that socially and politically has been what has, what's been so in, in, incredibly important. But I absolutely agree with you. Mm -hmm. Uh, on that, uh, for example, it's, it, as far as I can see, the, the study of history very often has been associated with the formation of national identity. Uh, that the, the American History Association, it's, I, I forget exactly the date, but it was the late 19th century uh, that, that was formed. The American Political Science Association uh, was formed, I'm trying to remember the date, but it was uh, either the late 19th or very early 20th century. Uh, so the, the study of, of politics and of history uh, in, in the United States uh, has had American in front of it and has had its, its, its purpose of that. And so we've had great national history and so we got, we, uh, we, traditionally we've done Russian history or British history or British politics or, 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 or we've done politics and history of, of nations. And, uh, or, or in, in popular culture, we've got uh, the, the American experience on PBS, which I love. I love all of those PBS shows. But it's a publicly funded series of shows about what it means to be American. So, uh, so uh, and, and then, of course, the role of, of, of race in this has been very uh, instructive. <coughs> But it, it still seems as though, or, or even in our uh, field of, of, of political science, we have courses on, like we've got lots of courses on American politics. Uh, or we have a course on British politics, or we have a, uh, a we're, go, we're thinking of hiring somebody on Irish politics. Uh, all of that stuff is great, but it does tend to be studying politics of nations. Uh, and, tr and stereotypically, I don't think it's so much true anymore, uh, but history courses very often were national uh, history. So uh, I, I think a lot of people have thought about, okay, so what, 
is, is that the way we should be studying these things? And, and then you've had the, uh, the development of social histories, saying that what we really need to do is not look at the histories and the politics of, of nations, but of social groups, of the, of the differences uh, um, among us. And there's labor history, and there's black history, and there's women's history and politics, and all of these different uh, looking at, at, at particular groups. And all of that is, is, is real, but it, it still seems to me that uh, what, uh, what the takeaway message from those is it, it tends to form identities associated with social or economic or gender groups or, or, or some, uh, something, all of which are real and, uh, and which exist. What, what I'm not aware of is that we have a course on human history. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I don't think that, that we do. Uh, and, and we don't have a course on human politics. We don't have political anthropology in our department. Uh, we have comparative politics, for example, but what do we compare? If you look at almost every textbook on comparative politics, it starts out with a bunch of themes, democratization, authoritarianism, the role of executives and legislatures and so on, and then the book ends up with a bunch of case studies of nations. And so we'll look at English politics and Nigerian politics and Mexican politics and so on and so on and so on. And so what we're comparing are nations uh, still. Uh, and, uh, and, and so it seems as though the national model or the social group model is the one which has dominated our study of political history and, uh, and, 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 and maybe other fields as well. Um, and that's why I like this stuff, because it seems to go before that uh, and say that all of these things are real, especially as they've developed, uh, but they're all part of a much larger set of political histories, which is um, uh, human and even transhuman uh, uh, history. I think if you push the story even further back than seven million years, it gets even more interesting, uh, which, uh, w which as a rule, we don't do at all here in, in the liberal arts e uh, either. So, so I think that you're, you're really right on emphasizing the, the importance of, of nationality and national identity as, as seemingly the, almost the unspoken intent of an awful lot of the educational structure, which especially makes sense uh, in public education. I mean, I get why the state is interested uh, in that. Um, uh, they they want to make good citizens, and you're a citizen of a nation. And, and, uh, um, but, but somehow we need to think beyond that. Now, I don't know if that's what you were getting at or not. Or maybe I should ask you how you would respond to your own question. What, what were you thinking of? <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I, I think that it clearly does. I mean, when you, when you study American history, I mean, there's, there's, there's no way around the, 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 the role of, the, of, of whites versus blacks. Or, or, or you maybe saw the fascinating story in Slate just a couple of days ago, uh, of, 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 and, and what we also tend not to cover so much uh, is, is the American experience with Native Americans. Uh, and it's not just that we push them off their land, uh, after all, there were hundreds of, of, of so-called First Nations here that had been existing here for 15,000 years or something before the, the, the Europeans uh, showed up. Uh, and, and, and in North America, we wanted to take the land and, and push them west, and so we have all those reservations out west now, and there's not that many, it seems like, here uh, in, 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 in the eastern part uh, of the country. Uh, but what's even more disturbing is very often at the end of the Indian Wars, you know, we had Andrew Jackson as famous as conducting those wars, but it goes back. There were wars in, 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 within years of the founding of Jamestown. You had the King's Phillips War uh, up in Massachusetts uh, b b between uh, the, the Puritans and, and, and the Indians. And very often at the end of these wars, the, the, the defeated Indians were not just captured, but they were sold into slavery and, and sold in, in the 
West Indies. Uh, so, so you have uh, sort of, and, and, and the Indian population or the Native American population dwindles from, we don't have good records, but there were millions, we don't know how many millions of, of, of Native Americans there, there were here in North America when Columbus arrived. By the beginning of the 19th century, there were 250,000. That's, uh, what word do you use for that? In other settings, you might call it genocide. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and we don't study that. It's really uncomfortable. When Andrew Jackson defeated the Creeks uh, in 1814, uh, he killed a thousand of them, uh, and uh, he took some of their skin and, and, and made uh, reins uh, out of them, you know, and, and, and did a body count by cutting mm -hmm. off the tips of noses and so on. I mean, it was this really gruesome sort of uh, history that we've got. Uh, and uh, and so, so if, if they used to be called the yellow race or, or the red race or whatever it was. Uh, so we've got the blacks and reds and whites and so on. And, uh, and that's central to, to American history. And we had you know, the Westerns of the 50s uh, uh, giving a sanitized uh, version of, uh, of all of this. But yeah, the role of race in the formation of national uh, identity is, is, is central and really tough to, to, to talk about. Uh, you know, it's easy for us now to sort of condemn the Israelis for gradually taking Palestinian land and driving the Palestinians out. But, but then, or it's easy to, to, to denounce the Turks for, for not wanting to use the genocide, the word genocide when they talk about the Armenians. Um, and the Turks always get very angry if you call that genocide. Uh, and sometimes we preach to the Turks saying, you need to accept your history. Uh, but we really haven't accepted our, our history. It's a, it's, a, it's a lot of hard aspects to it. And what does that mean now at this point uh, in reality? Uh, it, it, it raises a lot of disturbing questions. But yeah, so the, the role of race in the formation of, of, of national identity has often just been unstudied uh, and, uh, and hasn't been as central to, 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 to what we've done. But, uh, yeah, somehow it needs to be incorporated, and it's, it's, it's tough to do that. <laughs>